what's the difference in drafting where you've had success like you've had now versus maybe trying to get better quicker? How much different is the approach for you? Um, we're, we're just looking for the best players that help us win now and in the future, you know, and so there, there's a balance there that you decide at, um, all over the draft. I think, you know, Duke's done a great job um, managing that upstairs with all the scouts and, and Mike and everybody, and so uh, it's it's been a fun to be a part of, and I'm looking forward to see how it shakes out this weekend. Thank you. What, what's the biggest thing you get? Well, I guess what, your days leading up, like at this point, like what's the biggest thing you're checking off of as you get ready for Thursday? Well, I, I think our guys feel pretty prepared. You know, uh, the, the scouting department's been doing this, you know, all year, and the coaches have, have caught up these last couple weeks. Um, so, you know, you feel very prepared. I think if the draft started tonight, um, you know, our scouting department's done a good job to be ready to go. But there's always less. Like, you got three days left, so you might as well use them for different scenarios and things like that. And uh, it's just been fun to kind of go through the week and get everyone's opinion on things. Have you ever been in a room where things changed dramatically in the last week? Does that happen? I don't think so. Uh, you know, I, I haven't been in many rooms. This is my fourth year, you know, being in the draft room like that. Usually you're a position coach and and you go in there for the day that they talk quarterbacks, receivers, or whatever it is, and then you move on. Um, so, you know, it's just it's steady here, very steady, very experienced. Um, I think it's the right way to do things, and, and we always go into Thursday feeling very prepared. Are mock drafts a little bit more difficult uh, this year because there doesn't seem to be a consensus on the first pick in the draft? Never mind the Dusk ID position. I mean, it's you look at uh, quote mock drafts and guys are second pick of the draft, some drafts third, second, not even in the first round of another draft. Yeah. Same guy, I mean, it's crazy. I'm glad that's not my job. <laughs> so it's, uh, I know people got to put the mocks out there to, 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 you know, get the views and all that stuff. And it's, it's fun to look at. It's fun, trust me. You know, we all know people that look at them, and it's, it's fun to deal with that way. But um, it's important how, how our organization sees the board and who's there. And, and it may not be the same for every club, but um, ultimately we'll be on the same page with, with wherever we end up. And um, the, the real mock draft starts on Thursday, and it's a fun thing to be a part of. How, how important is the mock draft? Duke was talking about the mock draft the organization does. Yeah. And he said it always ends up being worst case scenario because guys mm -hmm. are picking people you guys are interested in. And so <laughs> if you get a decent prospect in your own mock draft, you're in pretty good shape. I think that's true. You know, he, he's right about that. You sit in those meetings and you hear, you know, who likes who. And, and it just, um, you know, we might see a couple of players different than some other clubs. But ultimately in our mock draft, that's where those guys go first. And so. It's good because you get a chance to talk through a lot of scenarios um, now when you have unlimited hours to talk through it and have those conversations um, to where you're not doing it when you're on the clock with however many minutes on the clock you know, on draft day. Uh, so again, Duke does a really good job moderating that over the course of these last couple of weeks and this week and, and making sure that we're all confident going into Thursday. How important in, in your mind is arm length, and particularly at corner and O-line? It's always part of the discussion. You know, I think it's one of the variables that's at your disposal. And then you measure that with, with a lot of other qualities that they have. So, uh, you know, th those are just discussions that you always have about prospects, whether it's speed or height or weight or size or how the weight's distributed or what the arm length is. And, um, you know, that can come up in a lot of different ways. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just part of the drafting process is figuring out what you're willing to take at that spot on that day and, and who fits your team and, and um you know, if you have weaknesses, how you can minimize that as best you can, or if it's a fatal flaw, and that can come in a lot of different ways, you know, and we just talked through all that stuff. How do you feel Jonah Williams played last season? I think Jonah's is an ascending player. So I thought he got better every week. Um, happy to have him. Jack, I know you've been Duke and the staff are <clears throat> close to the best. Don't want to tip your hand at all. How much do your, does your scouting department look at what other teams are doing? How do you know what's a smoke screen? And how much does that play into where we're going to, what's going to be available when we get there? Yeah, that, that's not a big conversation, is what do we think other teams are going to do? You know, because any information that gets out about this time is, uh, can be misleading, could be truthful, could be misleading. You just never know. So, again, it's part of following your process, making sure that you feel good about the order you got your guys in where they're going to fall at you. You try to anticipate all the discussions that could happen on the clock and have them now. Not worry too much about what we think other teams will do because they may have a player fall that, that they didn't anticipate falling and they take them and that changes everything that you thought you heard. So we don't get too involved in that. There are quite a few players in this year's draft that took advantage of the extra year because of COVID-19 and 
are a little bit more mature, a little older, a little bit more experienced. How much do you think that has benefited the overall depth of the team? I think that part's hard to say right now. Um, I think that's hard to say. You know, I, I, I couldn't tell you all the players, you know, you talk about in the top 100 what their ages are. We, we've, that certainly comes up. You can see it on the screen. But I, I couldn't tell you if overall it's an older group than it was in the past. Where those older players have shifted, maybe maybe they came back because they weren't top picks and they end up being in the sixth or seventh round. I, I couldn't tell you that. So I um, couldn't really give you a great answer there. When you were putting together the, the offseason plan, even before free agency, how important was the drop back passing element when looking at the offensive linemen that, that you were looking at, not only in free agency, but in the draft? You've got to evaluate what's your scheme, what's the direction you see going forward, and how every piece fits it. And so whether it's a receiver, a tight end, an offensive lineman, how do they fit how we want to play football? Um, you know, certainly we, we are a team that, that takes a lot of pride in drop back passing. It's one of the things we think we're really good at because we got really good players on offense that, that can maximize that. So it's always part of the formula. Um, th there's a lot of things that weigh into that, but um, certainly that, that's always a big part of it. Zach, okay, Zach um, Duke on Friday was saying that he didn't feel an overriding need to draft a starter, somebody that you can even at 31 to come in and start right away. But uh, in your discussions with him, when you're taking a guy at 31, are you looking at him being able to impact the roster very quickly? That's always your hope. It's always impossible to predict um, because you, you don't always have the full grasp of the information. You do your best to go in the school, talk to the sources, get to know the player of the process. You certainly predict that this player is going to come in and have an impact, but, but you never really know until they move to your city. They're part of your organization. You see how they practice, they go about things. Um, so, again, we, just, we take players that we think will be a good fit for us, short-term and long-term, and then see how they fit in immediately, you know, in, in training camp, see how they pick things up, and if we think they can play a prominent role or, or more of a backup role. So, again, it's hard to make those predictions. You hard to, hate to put that on 31 or 63, whatever it is, that this player, we expect them to come in and be a starter. We're picking them for a reason because we think they'll be a productive part of our team, and, and that's why we select them where we select them. If a guy isn't able to test during the pre-draft process or is, you know, having a, you know, one or two days of surgeries, like, uh, you know, how does that go into the evaluation process for you on the pre-draft? There's a lot of guys for a lot of different reasons, you know, that, that do this and don't do that. And, and again, you just got to do your best to take all the information you got and make a decision on if you think um, they, they fit what we want to do. You know, and so, again, it's never going to be perfect that you're going to have all the perfect amount of information and it's just going to be laid out that this is exactly what you're getting. Um, so, uh, again, guys guys work out. Some of them didn't get invited to the pro day and they work out on different surfaces at the pro days. And, and so you just got to do your best to, to trust your scouts, trust the coaches that have gone out there and worked them out, take the information in and, and make the best decision on the kid. Coach, Coach you look possible it, it's hard for me to know uh what information people have that, that we have you know but but i just know our, our guys spend a lot of time and energy our scouts in, in their area um to where they you really feel like they got a great grasp of of the guys in there and, and if we don't you try to go back through over these last four months and let the coaches aid in that and, and try to try to go out there and talk to the kid and zoom the kid and work the kid out and, and try to complete the circle on all the information um would people be surprised? That one's hard for me to answer because I don't know. Different people may, may be aware of, of what goes in the process and some don't. Thank you. Coach, you obviously got a good feel with the scouting department. Uh, like you said, your fourth year in this thing. How much has your comfort level grown and, mm -hmm. uh, with it? And what do you think is the strength with this particular you know, personnel department? I, I think there's no egos. Um, and so you're able to have um, – conversations that, that see both sides of the ball, you know, as, as it goes to a player. And, and it, I think it's always productive conversations. And so it's, it's important to have um, that everyone feels comfortable speaking their opinion, throwing scenarios out that maybe someone else hasn't thought of, how they fit our team. Um, they're always very productive conversations. You don't necessarily have to see in that moment eye to eye with somebody else on, on a prospect or, or the direction that we should go. And, and it's just good, healthy conversation. And so I, I think to answer your question, uh, I've got a lot of respect for all the scouts we got in there. You respect the job they do and their opinions. 
Um, the coaches then come and have the opinions and have a really healthy dialogue and ultimately get to a place where everybody feels good about bringing players in the building and everyone's happy that they're here and understand their strengths and weaknesses and how they can help us. And um, that's just that's that's the beauty of being a part of the Bengals is everyone's um, got an opinion that can be heard and it's never in a hostile manner. And, uh, you know, we get a chance to talk through a lot of the, the, the strengths of each guy. You, uh, you mentioned it being healthy to have, you know, a similar vision with the front office, but also – you know, disagreements and different talking points as well. Is that something you both tried to figure out about each other just in your interview process in 2019, maybe your similarities and differences and how you viewed the game? I think it's tough to nail down just in, in an interview process. You certainly touch on that stuff uh, to get just an overall sense of a philosophy. Uh, you know, I, I came in really just having been a quarterback coach and a receiver coach. So um, the roster building, you know, I had done my best to give my opinions, but but I'm, I'm sure they knew when, when I came in that it was going to be a work in progress as well. And um, I think that's what's so great about here is it's just helping everyone grow and continue to evolve and uh, not an expectation that you better have all the answers the day you walk in the building. You know, it was, it, we always knew it was going to be an evolution. And um, so, so far, I think it's worked out well. You reminded me there, like you said, you use your timeouts better in year three than you did in year one. Is like scouting a defensive tackle another thing you do better now than maybe you did in year one? Um, that's hard for me to say. You know, it, it certainly you've got a better understanding of maybe what we're looking for on that side of the ball. You know, and, and players you can reference them against players that we've had or, or lost, or uh, it's you got a better overall feel for the roster, I guess you should say. So you know how guys are going to fit, how we utilize our defensive personnel better. Same goes on offense, special teams. So I, I think in that way, everybody's probably improved. Are you of the belief that everybody in the organization should generally be on the same page about a player? When you're drafting. I, I don't think that's possible for all eight picks you got. You know what I mean? It's it's always someone's always going to have an opinion, and and that's fine. That's that's reasonable. That's probably expected. Um, everyone gets a chance to say their piece, so so you know. But ultimately, when somebody walks in the building, they're a Bengal, and we're all on board with it, and we're all going to make it work. So whether it was it was your pick or not, um, I think that's that's where we're at. Is it's always healthy when the player walks in, and everyone's. Everyone's on board and, and going to make sure that we have a very productive player that helps us out. Is, it, is there a big difference of feeling as you approach the draft this year, maybe as opposed to after that 2019 season? Um, can you further elaborate? This is just as you go through the process and y'all are coming off the Super Bowl as opposed to being, you know, having the number one pick. I mean, does it feel a little bit different knowing where you're at at this stage in the franchise? I, I guess so, just in the sense you've just got a better feel for your team and, and what – what needs maybe hit us a little um, a little more in the head than, than maybe two years ago, three years ago. So I think just overall your experience each year with the players who have been here um, and how we can aid them and, and get the most out of them with other players we can add, I think that naturally improves over these, these last couple of years. Are you able to drill down and have a pool of players you think are going to be there? or Because last year you were probably able to do that at five. Sure. Um, but this year at 31, is it that much of a crapshoot? Or can you drill down and say we probably have a shot at I'd say it's probably a bigger range than five, uh, to be honest with you. You know, yeah, yeah, you could pick a guy that you think is going later in the second round and have a great shot at getting him at 31, but um, it's probably a bigger pool than five, I would say. But, but we were in this situation two years ago with T. Higgins at 33. You know, it was just two picks off. We had the first pick with Joe Burrow. Um, that one was an easy one to talk about. You know, there, there was no indecision there. And then 33, you're playing the same game we're playing now at 31 of trying to predict – um, and do our own, you know, exercises to, to see who could be there at 33. It, it's going to be a decent range of players, I would imagine. Going back to the 2020 draft, you just mentioned Higgins. Did you guys celebrate after realizing that Higgins was still on the board that night? After many yeah, you know, I, everybody felt great about that, you know, and, and just um, the explosiveness he was bringing to the offense. And, you know, you thought he was going to be gone in the first round. So it, it is nice to wake up and know we know who we're taking. And uh, so that, that, yeah, that's a good feeling. Come on. Go ahead. I was say, the organization's been really receptive to, to offers to trade back it from early rounds, even before you got here. What, in your mind, it, what's the bigger variable? Is it, is it the compensation or is it how many guys you still have on your board that you think you'd still have a shot at? Probably a combination of both, you know. And ultimately, you know, we, we've got to expect to pick whatever number we're picking at. And then – um, again, I think that the, that's where the experience upstairs really comes into play of the number of drafts, you know, Mike Brown, Duke Tobin, everyone's been involved in, and the experience they have of trading when, for what value, why, 
um, way more so than I bring to the table. And so that, that's a fun process to be involved in for me, to watch them work um, with, with the patience and, and the, the uh, you know, just the, the calmness is, is, you know, similar to what we have to deal with in games. This is their, this is their game. And, and it's fun to watch them work there. And, and uh, again, just the, I think the experience really pays off in those moments. So it, would be, go ahead it would be disappointing to go home Thursday without a pick after sitting here all day. It, it just depends on how it plays out, you know, and that's, that's certainly, um, you just never know how it's going to happen. So, but I, I think you always got to expect to pick when your name's going to be called at 31 and then react from there. That's not that, but is this year's quarterback class maybe the big X factor? Um, and, kind of, and how have you guys kind of had to anticipate for what might happen given the, the weird quarterback year? I, I don't know that it's different than most years. You know, having been involved in the quarterback room, whether we were taking one or not at everywhere I've been, there's always the X factor of, of – how many first round picks are there? How many second round picks are actually going to go in the first? You just never know. And so I know much is made of it this year. To me, it's not all that different than, than other years throughout a year, 2013, 15, whatever it is. I'm just naming random numbers. But um, it, this isn't the first time, you know, th there's been maybe a lack of this is the clear cut number one, here's the fifth guy. And so we'll just see how it plays out. You know, it's impossible to make those predictions right now. You have the COVID factor in the middle, but have there been any changes to how you structure your physical draft room? maybe coming out of COVID now in terms of where everyone sits and who's in the room and stuff like that? Yeah, that's, that's, it's not my draft room. You know, yeah. it's, it's, I, I sit where Duke tells me to sit. And uh, <laughs> so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that there's, there's many differences there. Last couple of years, you've drafted a lot of captains, a lot of guys that seem to love football and you've had good drafts. Yeah. Has that strengthened kind of the resolve to stick to that formula? I, I think it's been a recipe for success, you know, and, and it's something you always consider. Um, so again, we, we talk in depth about every player and if they have issues, what are those issues? Are you willing to accept them? Um, again, th those are the, that's part of the process that's been going on now for six months with the scouts and two months with the coaches and, and you kind of make those decisions on who fits your team and who you want to bring into the building. James Waldman of the coaching staff, like you're talking about in all these meetings, I mean, it's kind of unique, um, here in Cincinnati as compared to other places, some places coaches aren't involved at all. Do you think that? When you go cross check, you know, coaches what their information other than the scouts, and then cross check the cross checkers and everything that goes along there. Do you feel like you guys are more prepared than anybody, even up to college free agents, in terms of what you know about players? I feel good about how we ended up, and it's it's again, it's impossible. I've only worked for three organizations, so I can't predict how we go up against all the other teams and how they do it. But um, I know that we believe in the process that we follow. We always feel like everyone's very prepared come draft night. There's a lot of work that goes into it from the scouts and from the coaches. And, and so, again, that's why, um, you know, we really commit to this time of, of the player acquisition part of the offseason, you know, and, and uh, it's kind of nice how it will shape up where our players come in the building after the draft because right now our focus is just on helping the scouting department with whatever resource we can be as coaches and helping us get the best players possible. It helps. It does not hurt because there's been a standard there. Um, they've played in big games, been a part of big moments. I think that really helped us this year. Now we've got a team of guys who have all been in those big moments, so I don't have to reference any more players that played on other playoff teams, players that played for winning teams. It, it's always part of the equation. Um, you want winners as a part of your team, and so you have to intangibly kind of research players and what, what do they have that's inside of them. Um, but, but certainly now we have a team of guys who have been on the big stage, been in the big moments, and come out on top. And so now um, that will always, I think, weigh into what we do. But, but again, players that fit us and, and uh, will make us better is what we're going to end up taking. When you personally are evaluating all these prospects and draft prospects in general, is film the biggest thing? Is it traits that, that catch your eye? Obviously both matter. Mm -hmm. but, but what's number one for you personally? Yeah, I, I always enjoy just kind of reading the, the background and the intangible stuff that we get from the scouts and, and then just watching the tape, you know. And, and then you get a chance after you put all that together, you, you hear about the, the measurables and the intangibles and the traits and all that stuff. And, and again, you just – it's all part of the information gathering process and you determine is this, is this the player we want with the information we have? And can we move forward? Can they help us win? Will they not? And, and you just have to make that decision. You get to make the call? You get to make the call after they're picked? Yeah, I do. Are any of those calls especially memorable over the last three years? 
You know, it's hard uh, because it's a phone call. And so when it goes quiet, what does that mean? Can they not hear you? Are they emotional? Uh, so it's, it's always, I do enjoy watching the videos that we always have, you know, of, of the players receiving the call because it, it completes the puzzle for me <laughs> on what happened. And so uh, it's life-changing. You know, it really is. It's cool to be a part of. Um, but but it, it's, I appreciate it more when I actually get to see, kind of see physically what the reaction was and, uh, because sometimes it doesn't always make sense when I'm on the phone. Do you have any uh, draft day superstitions? Like, no, no, I, I do not. Okay. I do not. I know Callahan's played on staffs where they go play golf Thursday morning, and so he's always pushing me to go play golf, but <laughs> I can't make it work this year. But he might be out there playing Thursday morning. Jack, you had a, a bunch of Bearcats in here. You went to their pro day yeah. on their staff in the lean years. Can you talk about the, how the perception of that program, guys coming out of that program, has yeah. changed to where it is now? Yeah, I mean, just, just talking to Coach Fickle, I mean, it's, it's a whole – it's two pages worth of guys you're talking about, you know, and it's just how impressive that is – um, and you're not talking about seventh rounders or free agents. You're talking about real guys that are going to come in and impact your program immediately. And so just the job that they've done, recruiting, developing, um, you know, just creating that winning mentality and, and raising that standard there has been phenomenal to watch. And um, just, just they got a lot of guys this year, you know, and, and I'm sure they're going to have a lot of guys next year and the year after that, just the way that they've done things. And it's really impressive to see. Are they starting to fall into that category of Ohio State, LSU, I mean, when you've got the number of guys they got that are that are in these these top rounds, it's it's um, they were in the college football playoff. They're one of the top four teams in all of football. So, um, absolutely, they're 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 rising up to that level. Is there an edge that maybe you get from having those guys in your own backyard? I know that everyone has the same film and numbers. Is there any advantage to that? I mean, you just you've got relationships with those coaches. You know, I, I, I those they got such a great crew over there and. Um, I think they want to see us do well. We want to see them do well. So that relationship always helps. I don't know that them actually being over there allows us to see them any more than we would from a team that plays in Florida or California. But um, you certainly hear the names more just over the course of the season with, with the, however that information gets to you. Um, so it's fun to follow and, and kind of be aware. And, and some of these guys, whether um, they were on the radar, you know, when I was there, they might have been juniors or sophomores. So this is kind of a class where these names register with me. I can remember – you know, who went to school where, and Cole Rain, Mount Healthy, all these guys are now in this class. So it's, it's, it's fun to kind of have some background on some of these guys. What do you think of the way the receivers have gotten paid this free agency period? Do you think about that in terms of maybe how that could affect the way people draft them? Do you guys have conversations that you guys have had, or is that too far to really in the future to really get a good feel for yet? Yeah, I think we've got really good receivers. We all know that. Um, you know, that, that'll be part of the process over these next couple of years. But but right now, we're focused on the present. Um, I think upstairs, you know, the front office does a great job of always managing the future as well. So um, that'll come up over the next couple of years, and I'm sure that'll be very exciting. Do you think, do you think the way that t other teams draft receivers this year or has, the, has changed maybe the market or the way people will be aggressive? Or do you have – is that – it's just kind of hard to tell. Hard to say because if you need a D lineman but you're thinking about the future of the receiver market and, and you're going to leave a huge hole there at three technique, then, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to win games. So it's hard to manage it all. That's, that's, um, that's Duke's job to manage all that. So uh, I just enjoy being a part of it. Zach, do you expect to get drafted coming out of Nebraska? And what was that weekend like? I was hopeful. Uh, didn't have high expectations. Was hopeful that you'd get your name called in the seventh round. I remember watching probably more of the seventh round than anything else. Um, I, th I think I played golf, the first, you know, I wasn't expecting to hear anything the first couple of days. So uh, the seventh round, you're, you're watching. Um, I remember John Gruden called me probably midway through the seventh round and started recruiting me. Um, and so, you know, I, he called and I thought I'm getting drafted by Tampa Bay and it was just to recruit me as a priority free agent, just so I can call plays in rookie minicamp and cut me. So, uh, <laughs> so I, learned, I look back now and it all makes perfect sense. Um, and uh, I even remember at the time, whether he remembers this or not, but I remember being in the hallway during OTA, so it was in June, and I remember crossing pads. I was, I was the sixth-string quarterback. We only had five in the building. Jake Plummer was never showing up, but I was the sixth quarterback in a five-man room. And uh, I remember crossing pads with Coach Gruden one time in the hallway, and he said something to me. This was on June 15th, call it. You know, hey, no matter what happens here, you can play in this league. And I'm thinking, no matter what happens here, we haven't really, like, really practiced yet. Am I? So that was my first warning sign that, that uh, I probably didn't have a bright future in Tampa. But, uh.
it, it worked out. That seventh round call yourself. Yeah, yeah. So. Coach, how much do you? Oh, I'm sorry. No, I just wanted to ask you, Coach. Uh, kind of going off Charlie's question. Since 2019, what do you think has been maybe the biggest change in the way you draft? Uh, what it might be? It seems to be. It seems to be less paperless. I guess. Is it? Is it more visual with? You know. The, Man, that's a great question. Um, I couldn't tell you if in 2019 we had the, you know, the, the magnets you put up on the board or not. Maybe you could tell me better than I could. I, I, now it's all on the computer. Uh, so I, maybe we did that in the first year. Maybe that's changed. I still have plenty of paper in my notebook, I promise you. <laughs> you know, so uh, the, Debbie's always got her work cut out for her to get all that stuff lined up. So um, it's a mixture of both, you know, and, and certainly um, – Again, I, you guys know me. I'm, I'm more notebook anyway and, right. and paper bound. I'm probably a little more old school that way, but plenty of guys use the technology that we have at our disposal. Is there anything you're doing differently maybe that you didn't do in 19? No. No, I'd say it's the same. Yeah, no, it's – it's. I, I like looking back at my old draft notebooks from 2019. Some of the players we have now, some of the players we play against. It comes up during game weeks, you know, where I like to look back and see kind of what my notes were on a player that we're facing. Um, so, no, I, I try to keep it as consistent as possible. Are you going to be looking at your notebook or your laptop? My notebook. I don't even know in a laptop. It's uh, it's it's in my desk. I'm sure it's a laptop, but I don't take it off my desk. So I just got my notebooks. Coach, uh, what from the pandemic Zoom era served you well that you could use going forward as we kind of get back to normal? Zooms, Zooms. We use them all the time. Um, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, for example, we can do staff meetings on Zooms sometime, you know, during the off season where maybe not everyone's around and guys were on the road for pro days and I want to do a staff meeting. I, I can do it on a Zoom. Three years ago, I'd never, never imagined doing that. So there, there's just a lot of things that way, interviewing the prospects, um, that you can use that. And and I, I think that's going to always be very productive for us. Thank you. Brooks has a lot of questions and, and a lot of opinions. Yeah. What's the hottest one? I'm not, I'm not going there. He's a, he's a locked vault right now. <laughs> he's in the mock drafts. You mentioned mock drafts. It's, I, I don't hear the end of it. When you were, how many has he done? Oh, I mean, it's 20 a night. <laughs> Two months. He was really mad at me that immediately after the Super Bowl, I didn't have all the information on all the players because the year before that I did. You know, I at least knew players. Um, come mid February because we got in the Senior Bowl and I at least you know could talk to him about guys. But um, he was just every single day. Who'd you watch? Who'd you watch? Who'd you watch? So that's fun. That's that's the cool thing about being a coach's kid is they're into it and they enjoy what I do and um, so it's good. You know we finally they get the chance to come back in the building. It's been the first time in three years they've been here. So you'll see them out there playing basketball sometimes on Friday afternoon. So it's it's good to get the kids back in the building. Uh, he he uh, occasionally will watch a guy. You know, it's more YouTube. You know, it's usually laying in bed at night. I'll let him watch two guys. They get to pick what position and watch two guys on YouTube highlights, which isn't how we'd ever watch it, but um, I don't tell them that. <laughs> how do you handle a situation where you interview a guy face-to-face with members of the organization for 20 minutes, half an hour, whatever, you know, sit down and interview, and it doesn't go very well, yet everything that you hear when you're gathering information from everybody at the school, this guy's the greatest thing since sliced bread. I mean, when you have that type of a disparity, how do you, do you go back and how do you, how do you go back and check? Yeah, you do your best. Sometimes there's more information you can try to gather. Sometimes there's not. You know, sometimes, um, you know, maybe maybe that's the end of the road on terms of how you're going to gain that information. But, but again, I, I always feel like you've got plenty of time. You know, if, if you talk to a guy face-to-face at the combine and had that experience, you've got two months to do your best to, to sort out, whether it's the scouting department or the coaches, to, to gather as much information. Zoom them more. Zoom them, you know, two, three more times. Um, so, again, there, there's plenty of time to always try to sort through those issues. But you're going to trust your personal stuff more than relying on other people's conversation or opinion on a guy. Yeah. And, it's, again, it's, sometimes it's not perfect. Yeah. Sometimes maybe you hear something and, and your experience has been different and um, you know that you're never going to have the complete picture until the guy walks in the door and you have him for a year, you know, and, and be able to answer those questions yourself. Have you ever asked a question at that combine I won't give you a specific one, but sure. You know, there, there's plenty of times like that. And, you know, the best, and this is not this year, this is over the years, when you got three guys that play on the same offense or defense and you can ask them the same question on a play and you get three different play calls and you're showing the same clip. 
and you never know who's right, you know. So uh, those, those are always the fun ones, you know, that, that happen every couple of years. So. That's a great question you asked, though, when the, you know, because I think a classic question is, who on your team would you, who on your team would you take with you? You know. Sure. Yeah. And, and, and um, is that? I mean, I guess that. I guess that can be illuminating too. Yeah, they, they can answer that for a variety of reasons. It's their college roommate, and they like him, or they think that he can help them win a Super Bowl. So you kind of got to get to the bottom of, of the answer. We're a couple of weeks away from a schedule announcement. Are you excited about the likelihood of primetime exposure for this team, or as the head coach concerned about Sunday night road games, short <laughs> weeks, and some of the things that go with that? It's what comes with the territory. You know, you, you win, and that's what's going to happen. I think ultimately that's a good thing, you know, for, for our fans to be able to see us in a variety of different ways, whether it's not a home game. Our, our games here on primetime games have been tremendous atmospheres. I think of the Jacksonville game. Um, I think of the, the playoff game against the Raiders. Awesome atmospheres. And so if we can replicate that, I think that's a good thing. It may not be the you know, superstar at the top of the draft kind of draft, but overall, top to bottom, in terms of depth of the draft, where does the organization feel this one is? I, I, that's always an impossible answer for me to give. Um, because it maybe is a little stronger at a position than it was the year before. And so some people may view that as a, because it's a primary position, it's a stronger draft or weaker draft, whatever it is. So I, I have always struggled with that. You just take it year to year. It is the draft that we have. Here's the strength of the different positions. Um, and you just try to make it work as best you can. When you guys rearranged the off season schedule, did you call players or the leadership group or anything? Or did you just tell them, hey, we're changing it and pushing it? <laughs> what was that like? It, it's, that's a decision we made as a coaching staff. You know, and uh, just felt that it was best for, for everybody involved. You know, and uh, coaches, players, um, again, we, we, you know, our coaches do go on the road and, and put in some good work. And so you just want them to be focused on player acquisition, helping our scouting department as best we can. And then once the draft ends, our players will be here and we can start that process. I think, I think you only want to two teams without mandatory training camp. Is that correct? I don't know. We don't have it. Uh, I couldn't tell you who else. What led to the decision of not having a mandatory? Um, you know, it's ultimately you can keep them here till five o'clock in a mandatory minute camp. We haven't done that when we've had the mandatory minute camp anyway. Um, you know, you can obviously mandate that the players are here. Uh, we'll just call it an OTA. It would be very similar to what we would do in a mandatory minute camp. Obviously, it's it's not mandatory, uh, but we've always had great attendance from our players. I think they're about the right things, um, and and so I, I still expect that we'll have a good turnout for this the six OTAs that we actually have. Guessing there wasn't much pushback on telling them that they can. <laughs> from the, any players that did contact you about that? It, it's been good. The players I've talked to, the feedback's been really productive. Zach, when you get a face-to-face -face or the one-on-one -on -one and the brief opportunity you get in the draft process, are you a vibe guy at all? Do you? How much does that play into what sense you get from him? Just you know, that, that, that one's a hard one because I would say, yes, you can feel certain guys, but then you also got to weigh in, is this his 18th interview of the night at the Combine? Um is this his, his 10th, 30th visit that he's taken? And he's been on nine flights already by the time he gets to you. So you do your best to, to weigh that information with maybe, you know, what people at the university say about the kid in terms of his energy. And um, so it's a, it's a, I think that's a slippery slope at times because um, you really don't know what the, what the player's going through during those 30 days that you're dealing with him. We asked Callahan this. What is, who is the best prospect you ever seen on tape? leading up to a draft. Uh, well, for me specifically, probably Andrew Luck. He was just the total package. You just interview the guy. <laughs> Size, speed, strength, football IQ, tangibles, background, productivity at Stanford. I mean, it was just the, the total package. Great player. But again, I was more quarterbacks, so that was kind of the world I lived in. But yeah, he was really impressive. More than Joe Burrow. <laughs> See, <laughs> I wasn't thinking about my own players. I was thinking about that. That would definitely be the answer. Uh, yeah, that's that's a horrible answer by me because he absolutely is the answer to that. But I'm thinking more to guys I scouted as a position coach, I guess. And that's uh, how I meant it. So 
<laughs> yeah, uh, I take I revise my answer. It's Joe Burrow, and then Andrew Luck. <laughs> so make sure that's in your stories. A hundred percent. I mean, the guy never lost, shattered every record known to man. So easiest decision we've ever made. I think you all agree. Yeah. See, <laughs> I can't. Why would I even answer this question? Uh, yeah, yeah, they're all up there. If it makes you feel any better, I asked Duke that question before Joe Burrow was drafted. He said Andrew Luck. Okay. So. Yeah, see, I, th I think it's, yeah, you start thinking back to not recent memory. It's it's more long-term, so that's a trick question. I don't like that. <laughs> it's not, you didn't mean it as a trick question, but I made it a trick question, and now I feel terrible. <laughs>